Okay, greetings and welcome to each one who is drawing near by faith this morning. God bless you so much in your, in your life, in your journey of faith, in your relationship with God. And um, we hope and pray and believe there will be something so encouraging for your hearts this morning. Uh, something to um, build you up, to uh, lead you in your, in your thoughts of faith this morning. Um, special greetings to our local church family here in Peacehaven. Um, we are praying for one another. We're missing one another, of course, but also staying connected. <clears throat> it's wonderful to hear the stories of different ones who have um, been able to help and minister to different uh, brothers and sisters in the church. Uh, this week we were delivering food uh, uh, to people. Um, we're making phone calls. We're delivering uh, CDs of the sermons for those who are not on the internet and things like that just to try and minister to people. We're starting uh, a Barnabas ministry. Um, it came to me yesterday and I thought this would be a wonderful thing. So we're going to start a Barnabas ministry, which means... Um, uh, different people in the church calling each other so that we make sure that everyone in the church gets at least one phone call uh, a week or a couple of phone calls a week. Of course, I've been calling people and the elders have been calling people, but um, uh, just to help stay on top of that and also to hear from different ones would be a blessing. So if you're interested in that and you'd like to call some brothers and sisters, I'm sure you're doing that anyway, but, uh, but certain ones that we can be sure that we uh, remember together. So uh, if you're listening on Facebook, hit that share button right now. That's uh, an opportunity to share with people. If you haven't yet subscribed to studytheword.co.uk, please do that on YouTube. That will be a great blessing and help and a way for you to stay connected with sermons and messages as well. Don't forget, all of our messages are archived on our website, which is um, pefc.co.uk. Go to the sermon pages. There's all kinds of series there from uh, different books of the Bible, the Old Testament, Bible classes on Acts and Daniel and different things. This is a great opportunity to be in the Word and studying uh, the Bible together like that. There's also a podcast subscription, which means if you subscribe to our podcast you get the messages on, on your phone every week so great ways to stay connected and in the faith um, as we get ready to pray together we remember that we are in a series on faith and uh, and let's pray together by faith so father we thank you this morning that we can draw near with a full assurance of faith persuaded in our hearts that you are you are faithful you are able you are good you hear us and our prayers uh, move your heart move your hands we pray together this morning for your help for your blessing on our lives for your uh, for your presence to be evident in this time wherever we are listening, God, that your spirit will quicken our hearts and teach us this morning and bless us. Be lifted up this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, as we give our focus together this morning to the Lord uh, with his word open, uh, we're in Hebrews 11 and we'll be looking back to the book of Exodus. So if you have a Bible, you can follow with us. Remember, the book of Hebrews is written to Hebrew Christians. Um, many of them would have been new Christians, also some Hebrews who were not yet Christians, but interested in thinking about the gospel and hearing about this idea of that you are saved by grace through faith. You may have thought, oh, is this something new? For Judaism had become some, some, something of a, a system of good works. And was this new that we, we would... Um, we would live by faith. So the author of Hebrews uh, demonstrates using s certain men and women of faith from the Old Testament that it was always an issue of faith, that we are saved by faith and the just shall live by faith. He shows that 
uh, Abel and Enoch and Noah. It was all, uh, they all had relationships with God that was based on faith. They were rightly related to God by faith. And then, of course, their faith was demonstrated in their lives. The author leads us then uh, through the patriarchs, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and then he brings us to Moses. Um, he leaves the book of Genesis chronologically, and now he comes to the book of Exodus, where we will see um, Israel, who's now become a great nation, delivered from Egypt. And the author gives us a condensed version of Moses' life in verses 24 to 29 of Hebrews 11. But before he gets to Moses' own demonstration of faith, in verse 23, he looks to the faith of his parents. So we read together Hebrews 11:23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. We discover his parents, Amran and Jochebed, were people of faith. They were remnant believers during this incredibly difficult time. And we, we look to this, uh, the, we, look, we frame this verse with the context by going back to Exodus. So go, come with me to Exodus chapter 1. In verse 6 it says, And Joseph died, all his brothers also, and all that generation. Now we remember last time we studied together when Joseph gave the instruction concerning his bones, that finally when the Exodus would come, they would carry his bones uh, from Egypt that he would be buried in the Promised Land. Um, time goes on, the years pass, 40 years, 100 years, that generation passes, 200 years and the people of God are remaining here in Egypt. Verse 7, the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceeding, exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now what comes to your mind when you read that verse? What should come to our mind is the promise the covenant that God made to Abraham, that he would multiply his seed, that he would make of them a great nation. Here we see the fulfillment of what God promised to Abraham, that your seed will be as the stars of the heaven and as the sand of the seashore. And here it was happening in Egypt. It was back in Genesis 46 that God said to Jacob when he was migrating to Egypt, he said, I will make of you a great nation there in Egypt. I will go down with you to Egypt and I will surely bring you up again. So God had assured him, Jacob, in Egypt, that's where I will make of you a great nation, but I will be with you there and I will bring you up again. Another promise, prophecy spoken to Abraham back in Genesis 15, 13, he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge and afterwards they will come out with great possessions. So there's a prophecy there that they will be strangers in a foreign land for 400 years and they would suffer affliction. And of course that's exactly what happened. It's about 430 years from when Jacob and his family moved to Egypt to the point of the Exodus. And time is moving on. The years are rolling on. It's coming up to that 400-year point. The deliverer is soon to be born. His name will be Moses. And when he's 80 years old, that's when he will finally deliver the people out. Verse 8 there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, let, lest they multiply. And then in the event of war, they would join our enemies, fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Pharaoh obviously couldn't know that he was really trying to oppose God, the work of God, the plan of God, the promise of God. 
But could Pharaoh stop the hand of God? Could he prevent the people multiplying or coming out of the land? Of course, he could not. Therefore, he set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh the supply cities, Pithon and Ramses. In these verses, there are the things that are seen, the taskmasters, the burdens, the sweat, the slavery, the the bricks. But then there is the unseen, just as real, just as sure, the hand of God, the promise of God, the eternal purpose. Verse 12, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. We see this principle in in history also with the Jewish people who have been persecuted all through history. One of the marvels uh, in, in our faith and in the Bible is the Jewish people. Uh, both their persecution and their preservation are powerful testimonies to the fact that they are the people of God and that God is fulfilling his promises towards them and certainly will do. Uh, much of that is, is still ahead. So they grew the more they afflicted them. We see the principle also in church history. The more the church is persecuted and afflicted, the more it grows. There is unbelievable growth in countries today where there is persecution of the Christian faith. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar, in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. Oh, we imagine this existence, the pain, the shame, the humiliation, the hardship, uh, the groaning of the heart, the slavery. Um, Yet they were not yet crying out to God, but that was soon to come. And when they begin to cry out to God, oh, he, he hears them. And interjected here is the amazing story of the midwives in verse 15. The king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom was the name Shifra and Pua. Uh, It's possible that they were chief midwives, responsible for others under them. And he said, when the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women come upon you, and you see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, you shall kill him. If it is a daughter, then she shall live. We see verse 17. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. And notice, they feared God. And the fear of God brought a, a respect and a reverence for human life. Because they believe God. They refuse. Why did they refuse? Because of faith. Because they believed in God. They, they could not do this thing. Many times people do things because they do not fear God. And many times, especially as Christians, there are things that we do because we fear or we, we are in reverence before God. All God-fearing people are amazing people people to be honored and valued and, and, and trusted because they fear God and live before God. They don't live before men. So the king of Egypt, verse 18, called for the midwives and says, why have you done this thing and saved the male children? Oh, you wouldn't understand, Pharaoh, but we live before another king. We live before God and we fear him more than we fear you. In Acts 14, 19 Peter and John answered and said to those in authority whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God you judge again in Acts 5 29 but of course this isn't how the midwives answered Pharaoh in verse 19 they said the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them they of course were not honest here before Pharaoh, they wanted to preserve life. So as they stared in the face of evil, they had this story to preserve life. 
This is like many in World War II who were also hiding and protecting Jews, Jewish children and babies and families and hiding them and looking in the face of evil. They would uh, look the other way or lie or hide people in the basement and things like that. It says that God honored them. Look, verse 20, and God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God, he provided households for them. And we say, oh, there's a whole other story here. I'd love to hear more about Shifra and Pua and their families and their households and their children. But we don't hear any more. It's a wonderful principle, though, that God honored them. It seems that though they were midwives, they didn't have families of their own, but that's what God gave them. God blessed them. And if you seek first the kingdom, he will add these things unto you. First Samuel 2, 30, God says, honor me and I will honor you. So Pharaoh steps up his efforts. He commanded all his people saying, every son who is born, you will cast into the river and every daughter you will save alive. Oh, how horrific this was that baby boys were being taken from their mother's arms and thrown into the river Nile to their deaths. And this was in the attempt to stop the growth of a nation. But how could God help them? God hear them. How would he deliver them? And it's amazing that often in the worst, worst possible situation, in the place of death and pain and hopelessness, is where God brings birth to amazing uh, redemption and life and promise. And this is what happens here. For the irony is that the deliverer, Moses, would be drawn from these same waters, these waters of death where so many perished, from those same waters would be drawn Moses, whose name means one drawn from the water. Now, how would God answer this situation? And it opens with us in Exodus chapter 2. So now we have the context. These were the times that Moses' parents were living in, with the fear and the heartache and the, the murder of, of babies in the most challenging times. And they faced it in faith. Simple faith stands against the evil of their time. And we read in verse 1, A man of the house of Levi went and took his wife, a daughter of Levi. We read in Numbers 26.59, Amran's wife was Jochebed, and she bore Aaron and Moses and their sister Miriam. So it says in verse 2, So the woman conceived and bore a son. Imagine falling pregnant during this time, wondering, oh, am I going to have a boy? Am I going to have a girl? And finally the, the day comes, the, ch the baby is born, and it's a boy. They already had an older daughter, Miriam, and three years before they had had Aaron, and now there is this third boy born. We don't have chapters written about the parents, but these things we can gather about them. We can assume that they are remnant believers of faith, for that is why they are recorded in Hebrews 11. They acted by faith. They would have been among those who were crying out to God because of the bondage that they were in and their prayers came up to God. This is in uh, at the end of this chapter. God hears their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and looked upon the children of Israel. This is the verse that uh, Hebrews 11.23 refers to, right here in Exodus 2.2. When she saw he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. Now here it makes mention only of the mother. And certainly the mother would have more to do with the caring of a, of a baby. Any memories uh, of her tender care would cause this reference, for Moses was the author as he looked back. But Stephen makes mention of the father's house in Acts 7.20. At this time Moses was born and was well pleasing to God and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. So the author of Hebrews includes the father and the mother. He just says the parents. Obviously the father was involved. It was 
he was involved in the safekeeping of the son, fully consenting and helping and risking his own life and family also. And it says, when she saw it was a beautiful child or a goodly child or special or better, Stephen says, exceeding fair. Now, all parents would say that of their baby, but it seems to infer something more here. It's speculated that perhaps somehow they'd already been, um, God had already let them know that there was something special about this child. Perhaps there was some type of visual confirmation of that. We do not know. But they hid him for three months and they did it by faith. Oh, what a long three months this would have been with, the, with those searching for babies and taking them out, hearing of others taken, your neighbors, and praying every day. It's what it says. She did it by faith. There are certainly other parents of course, that would have been trying to hide their babies. It would be the natural thing for any to do. But here it says they did it by faith. Perhaps there were others who did it by faith, also praying to God. We don't have those stories. But this is recorded because it was the raising up of a deliverer. And God answered them and helped them and provided for them. They trusted God in hiding the baby. Now, someone might say, well, that sounds like a contradiction. They were trusting God, and yet they were hiding the baby. Why would you hide if you were trusting God? For isn't God able to protect the baby? But isn't there a balance? Isn't there a practical balance of a faith that would take risks, and yet practical wisdom and care and stewardship in life? Of course there is. It would be like someone who goes on the mission field. And of course, there might be a risk of their life. And there must be care that is taken. Practical wisdom is needed. So, um, Hebrews 11.23 adds this for us. It says, they were not fearing the wrath of the king. So they were doing this by faith. And they were not fearing the wrath of the king. They weren't hiding the baby because of fear for their own lives, but they understood that, they, that the child's life was in danger and they hid it by faith, not afraid for themselves. But faith brings with it courage. Now, the next part of the story is, of course, not mentioned in Hebrews 11, but it's part of the same narrative. She was operating in faith. It says, when she could no longer hide him, we don't know why. The baby is growing, it's crying. Uh, the circumstances are getting more difficult. We assume that God put this in her heart. She took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, put the child in it, laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. There are three arks mentioned in the Bible and each one of them holds something so precious. Imagine the mother having to make this ark and imagine the moment when she's finished, when she has to take her child, her little precious baby boy, and put it in the ark and put it in the river. She has to put the most precious thing in her life in the ark. Maybe times in our life where we have to do that also by faith. We, we give it to God. We trust God. We, we push it from the shore into the, into the reefs. And we are trusting God for the outcome. She's not knowing what, what will happen. It seems as though she involves Miriam, her daughter, in the story. For verse 4 says, And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. And then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And oh, don't you see the whole circumstance here? filled with the providence of God, the timing of God, the, the wind and the water and the reeds and the timing of Pharaoh's daughter coming down with her maidens at that time and there bobbing on the water is that little ark. Oh, and the providential plan of God bringing the answer uh, to that incredible situation for God is a redeeming God and works all things together for the good. 
So she sends her maid to get it, and she brings back the ark, verse 6. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. And then at this moment, Miriam comes up. She approaches the, the group, Pharaoh's daughter and the maids there. She approaches the group and she speaks up, verse 7. Shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? She was obviously a very brave, bold, smart girl. And in, in, in this question implies that there were many Hebrew women who had lost their babies and, and could, could nurse the child. Miriam thinks, oh, I know just the one. I know just the Hebrew woman. I know just the mother. And Pharaoh's daughter says to her, go. So the maid, maiden, Miriam, went and called the child's mother. Now, imagine Jochebed is at home. She's, she's sitting down. She's weeping. She's waiting. She's thinking, what has happened to my baby boy? She's praying. Oh, God, please protect him. Please work a miracle here. Please, Lord, I ask you. And then at that moment, she hears the footsteps and, and Miriam runs through the door and their eyes lock. And the question does not need to be asked. They both know. And Miriam begins to tell her the story. I was waiting. I was waiting in, in, you know, in the trees and I was watching. And I waited, and I waited, and I prayed. I didn't know what was going to happen. And then suddenly Pharaoh's daughter, they come down to the bank, and she's going to bathe. And before I know what happens, they see the ark. I watch the whole thing. They bring the ark. She's telling her mother this story. And when they looked in, I, 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 I found myself walking towards them. And before I knew, I asked, do you want me to go and get one of the Hebrew mothers? And she, she said, yes. So Miriam says to her mom, so here I am. I've come to get you to, to nurse Moses. And Jochebed can't believe what she's hearing. And they run together. They run back to the river, back to the Nile as quick as they can. They come back to Pharaoh's daughter. And this is what she says. Pharaoh's daughter looks at the, Moses' own mother in the face, not knowing it is the mother, and says, take this child away and nurse him for me. I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Jochebed takes the child away, probably in the, in the little ark, still carrying it away in wonder of what God has done. And when we read this as Christians, we marvel at this. And we want to do a dance and just say hallelujah. That is amazing. We just marvel at the ways of God, the providence of God, the plan of God. An old Christian, don't we? Can't we see that in our own lives? His hand of providence that God does not leave us. He does not forsake us, but he works wonders. He says here, I will pay you. She doesn't only get to have Moses back to nurse him, but she is paid to do so. She hid him by faith. She made the ark by faith. She put him into the hands of God by faith. And God was faithful not only to keep her son but he is protected and she gets to nurse him and she is paid to do it oh we marvel at god's hand here's a principle that simple faith can bring down great strongholds this little baby in the hands of this jewish mother would be the deliverer of israel it reminds us of the prayer of hannah in first uh, samuel chapter 1 and 2 and she prays and God hears her prayer and the answer to her prayer changes a nation bringing Samuel onto the scene so the future of Israel rested on the hiding of that little child by faith they hid that child and the future deliverance of the whole nation bringing fruition to God's promise to Abraham and to his seed was through that act of faith. We need to be so careful not to despise the small acts of faith that might be seen in someone's life, in their own family, in their prayers, in their giving, in their going, in acts of kindness, whatever it may be. Don't despise those small things for God can do great things through them. 
even as a mother and we're raising children and the challenges that come with that. And they get to their teenage years and we're praying and we're doing all that we can. We never know what God may do. Or in ministry, we might get tired or weary. We're putting out the chairs or we're working on the website or we're doing children's ministry, whatever it might be. But the little things by faith can be greatly blessed and multiplied and used by God. Now, as we bring this to a close, verse 10, and the child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son and she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. So what's amazing in this story is that Moses was able to be raised those crucial years, those early years with the family, with his mother and father and little brother, uh, older brother Aaron and Miriam. We can imagine how uh, Jochebed would sing songs to him and, and tell stories to him and whisper in his ears prayers with him at the bedside at night. It would have an effect on his life, as, as with Timothy and his, his mother and grandmother, Eunice and Lois. She prayed for him and she told him stories of faith. And you know what stories she would have told him? It doesn't say it here, of course, but we can almost 100% guarantee that these were the stories that the mothers were telling their children at night. It would have been the story of Joseph. It would have been the remarkable story of God's providence of bringing Joseph to Egypt to save his brothers and for the family to move to Egypt and become a great nation and they were waiting for deliverance. You can be sure she would have told the story of Joseph's bones that they still had in that little coffin waiting hundreds of years for the day that those bones would be taken back to the promised land in the Exodus. And guess who it was who carried those bones? It was Moses. We read of it in Exodus 12. And Moses took the bones with him when they came out of Egypt. Amazing. There was something deep and powerful instilled in Moses' heart. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. Nevertheless, he grew up with a, with a faith that had been instilled in him and he knew that he was one of God's chosen people. He knew that he was a Jew. If we look in the next verse, it says, Now it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown, this is jumping ahead 40 years, that he went out to his brethren and looked at their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren. So he looked this way and that way and when he saw no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. We get a further insight from Acts 7, the short commentary there in Stephen's sermon. It says in verse 22, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren. It came into his heart. That's implying that this is something that God put in his heart for that timing, for that purpose, to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. And notice this verse. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So this tells us when Moses was 40 years old, he already fully understood that he was the deliverer, that God had set him apart for this purpose, that God had this calling on his life, that he would be the one who would be raised up and lead them out. It was something that was in his heart, something that he understood. And because of that, he refused one thing and he chose another. In Hebrews eleven twenty four, by faith Moses, when he came of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing of the pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. He was raised as Pharaoh's daughter, but here it says he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He refused one thing and he chose another. Why? Because of faith. Because he believed the promise. 
He, he longed and, and believed in the Exodus, just had, as God had promised. And oh, let us live by faith as God-fearing Christians. Let us be refusing one thing and choosing another because of faith. Let us not be sucked into the pleasures and the treasures of this world, but let us be desiring to uh, considering the greater treasures that come in Christ, being persuaded of things not seen and assured of things hoped for, looking for the reward. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for this wonderful story of Moses' parents and their faith in you. They trusted you and how you honored them beyond their wildest dreams. We see in this story your amazing faithfulness, your, your, your sure hand concerning your promise. We see in this story your great providence how you work all things together for good, how you have a plan. And we believe and see that in our own lives as we live by faith. We pray for any who are listening this morning that are perhaps not Christians and not sure of your salvation. Or the only, assur- the only, only assurance you find is when your faith is in Christ, not in what you do for him, but what he has done for you. Trust him this morning as we're praying for you, as Christians are praying, as God has a plan for your life, say in your heart, Jesus, I trust you as my Savior today. Save me by grace through faith. And for all of us Christians here listening, help us uh, this day, this time, this challenging time in our lives. We thank you for your daily graces and presence and purpose. And uh, we love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, God bless you. Amen.